Well, hello everyone. You're listening and watching Rashkin Report, and I'm your host, Yuri Rashkin. I'm very excited that you are here with us because it's so much better than uh, doing this alone. Uh, speaking of not doing this alone, I'm very excited to be joined in this virtual type of studio here by uh, sports journalist Slava Malamut. Slava is a star of at least Twitter. Uh, possibly other platforms, but Twitter for sure. So hello, all uh, Slava followers. I, I'm being one of them. So um, what I wanted to get together and discuss with Slava today is this movie, Navalny, which I think is uh, worthy of discussion in English. And I am you know, Slava is another one that we, we could have done this in either language. And a little later, we're going to come back and, and do something similar, different in Russian, but in English for the benefit of um, English speakers. Slava, hello. What do you think of Navalny? What do you think of the movie, first of all? Let's start with the movie. Did you watch the movie? Of course, yeah. What did you think? Uh, well, for those of us who have followed, uh, the story. Obviously, there was no revelations there at all. It's the stuff that we already know, that we've seen, also sort of seen about these videos and uh, followed the whole story with the, the, with the poisoning and his own investigation of his own poisoning and the brilliant work of uh, Christo Grozev, the Bellingcat investigator who uncovered the identities of the would-be assassins. None of this was anything new, and of course, Navalny has probably been the only relevant opposition politician in Russia for the last 10 years. So, of course, uh, his career has been uh, quite uh, extensively documented. Uh, but I think it was an important movie in uh, um, bringing some depth to the character of Navalny and uncovering some, some of those details that maybe have evaded the Western public. Uh, up to now, because uh, there's still a lot of uh, misconceptions about him and a lot of uh, controversy about him in uh, in the West. A lot of questions being asked about who exactly he is and what he might represent and what kind of a potential leader he might be for post-Putin Russia, because let's face it, if there is anyone in Russia who could be considered an alternative to Putin, um, to take Russia in a different direction, he's the only person that comes to mind. So uh, to flesh out his character and to uh, uh, bring some nuance to who he is, that movie was extremely important. And of course, the thriller, the, the thrill portion of it, the whole investigation and poisoning thing, for those who have not been following it very closely, that made it so much more gripping and so much more interesting. Well, he certainly comes across as a very charming person, which is not, you know, Vladimir Putin or, or really any Russian ruler we can ever think of. So I guess that makes him different already. But um, do you think that that movie was uh, being done to make him look good? There's certainly some aspects of his personality that were glossed over, for sure. Uh, he is uh, very charismatic. He is also, uh, without a doubt, personally brave and very principled. Um, his um, the positive qualities are uncovered quite well and truthfully. There is nothing that was said about him that is not true. Uh, but uh, there is also the whole issue of nationalism, participation in the Russian marches. Uh, the gatherings of the Russian ultra-right uh, were mentioned, but I think there was like a whole of 45 seconds dedicated to that aspect of his political career. Uh, his comparing Muslims to uh, rodents, for example, or insects was never mentioned. Some of his more controversial statements, statements were never mentioned. And... Uh, one thing that was also, and you know, to be fair, a lot of these statements uh, uh, that he made were made a long time ago, and his 
associates at least have claimed that he has tempered his views, views since, though uh, he has never specifically repudiated them that I know of. Uh, but well, it's, it's an interesting, uh, it's, it was an interesting balance that you, you're kind of alluding to that I think they struck in the movie because they mentioned that there has been some criticisms of Navalny, but with the criticisms they mentioned, what they actually mentioned was very mild. I mean, they show him standing on stage and saying like a musketeer, one for all, all for one to an American ear, English speaker ear that that's not even like, what's the downside here? So I think that they did not go certainly into as as, as much depth as, um, as, as, as I think people who like to go into those things can go. People who don't like Navalny have all these episodes, I think, sometimes memorized um, and can recite them like uh, Bible and verse, you know, in this year he did this and then that. And I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, and they also kind of let him brush those questions off. He said uh, some to the effect of, you know, read my previous statements. Like, yeah, this movie is made for the people in the West who don't barely know know him. I mean, they're not going to read his previous statements. They're not going to research what he said in 2010 or 2012. And then he said, well, you have to be next to people that you might find distasteful because we're trying to unite that position. And... Uh, you know, to people in the West, that's kind of a that's that's a very yucky statement you know, sometimes because uh, anything that smacks of racism or uh, religious intolerance is definitely not something you want to be associated with under any circumstances in the Western realities. Uh, and yeah, I can understand why the producers of the movie who wanted to uh, may uh, present a heroic. Uh, image of Navalny would not want to dwell on this. Uh, I would personally like to hear a little bit more about what his views are now. Does he uh, still consider uh, Islamic people, or Muslim people of Russia, to be a threat to the, to the Russian ethnicity? What, what he thinks, uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about uh, his views on Ukraine. Uh, he very famously, I mean, he said he wants to stop the war, but uh, and that's something that we can touch upon later. I think he's, he's still pretty much a Russian imperialist at, at heart. He believes. All right, then, then let's define what's an imperialist here, because I think to me that means that if uh, Navalny were to become president of Russia, which at this point seems still a little far fetched, but who knew that Putin would start a war? So crazier things can happen. Uh, so well, whatever. <laughs> I'm just like this is this rolling back and back. Um, but with uh, he's Navalny is not going to start uh, letting all the provinces that may want to go their separate way and to you know turn Russia into more I don't know like a functional country that has like smaller in size and it doesn't have to be ruled by you know punishment or fist from Moscow you know that that whole dynamic how can he go against it because is he going to be anti uh Russian state because Russian state is so imperialist in its nature I mean how can he do this that is a great question I personally believe that if Russia is to have any future as a force for good in this world for lack of a better word uh Russia needs to dump uh, the government structure, the state structure that had, it has had since Ivan the uh, Third. So we're looking, we're looking uh, at the late 15th century. So it's the last, the last uh, 500 plus years of its history it need to be basically is flushed down the drain because that is uh, what that, that that's the type of state that Russia has been is uh, centralized, authoritarian. Um, uh, repressive state. And uh, I don't think Navalny wants that, obviously. He doesn't want a state where, first and foremost, government officials are not accountable to the population. That's his whole thing. I mean, he's anti-corruption. He's anti, uh, the, he's anti-authoritarianism. He's anti-centralism. Uh, he doesn't want a state where all the decisions are made from Moscow. Uh, and uh, in that regard, 
he is definitely going against the grain of Russian history and good for him. Uh, but I think he still believes in the Russian Empire. He still believes in a mighty, glorious Russia that uh, might not be gathering lands by force, but uh, would have an extensive sphere of influence and have a strong army, strong military. And, you know, that might not be uh, such a bad thing in a vacuum, in an abstract world. Um, a lot of countries want that. But in the case of, uh, of Russia, that is a fraught prospect. I think that uh, a country, if Russia is preserved as a huge imperial nation with a mighty military and uh, pretensions of ruling a uh, Slavic world or being a leading guiding influence of Eastern Europe, there's always a potential of Russia becoming aggressive again. If not under Navalny, then some, under somebody else. And even if Navalny is the leader of that, of that Russia, uh, there will always be a hawkish fra fraction of the military or politicians who will want Russia to be more aggressive, who will want Russia to keep uh, maybe a future democratic Belarus from uh, rapprochement with Europe, who will consider the collective West to be a, uh, an enemy, who will um, uh, come, try to combat cultural influences of Europe, and, you know, the, the toleration, the of sexual minorities, the uh, racial mixing, that kind of stuff that I know Navalny is not too hot about either. He's, uh, he's definitely a conservative at heart. Uh, he's uh, more of a libertarian conservative. He's more of a conservative in the Western sense of the world, of the world, rather than the Russian sense of the world, where it basically means, you know, beat everybody up and <laughs> who, who is not for authoritarianism, but he is still a conservative and he is, as a Russian imperialist, he would still be likely to try to uh, combat Western influence in Russia. But, you know, that what we're talking about, obviously, is all hypotheticals, whether or not Navalny would become a leader of Russia is still a big, a big if. And I think another thing that the movie kind of glossed over, or not didn't even actually mention at all, is the fact that he is for all of his personal bravery and all of the amazing work he has done in the name of transparency, he's not a tremendously good politician. Uh, he is a great uh, exposer of truth. He is a great communicator. He's a tremendous populist, but he is not a good politician. He is not good at building alliances. He's not good at building bridges. And for all he said about you know trying to bring more people into the opposition, he has not been a unifying figure in the Russian opposition. He was mostly concerned about doing his own thing, about the, writing his own website, about- Well, I think he just wants everyone to be unified around him. Exactly, he wants to be the leader. He's not good at sharing power at all. But that doesn't make him like a, a, you know, a authoritarian leader in that sense. It's a strategy that if you think that you have the best chance of winning, you know, if you're the star of the team, Shouldn't everyone unite around you? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good sports analogy. We are both of us, I think, <laughs> like those. Uh, yeah, he is, uh, he's definitely more of a Michael Jordan type. Give me the ball, let me make the decisions. But in a fractious Russian opposition, which is already in a huge minority and needs a unified front, he has not, been, he's not, he's not proven that he could be a unifying force. He's definitely made a lot of enemies in his own camp. Uh, probably a lot more than he made allies. Uh, but he is very popular with uh, the active part of the Russian society, the people who are interested in politics, people who you know are on the internet, who are trying to find, find out as many facts as possible. And for a populist, he is surprisingly and refreshingly sane. He does not espouse conspiracy theories. They're just huge. I mean, you hardly ever see a populist politician who is not into some nut job conspiracy theory or another. I mean, he does not espouse conspiracy theories. He was probably the only prominent Russian politician, for example, who has not said anything nasty about Greta Thunberg, <laughs> who is the most favorite of all boogeymen in Russia. I mean, if... if, if uh, Pro-Putin and anti-Putin factions were to unite against anything. 
they would unite against feminism and Greta Thunberg and Black Lives Matter. Those three well, things. Yeah, because I think children speaking out of turn and, and all of that kind of uh, dynamic on top of everything else and telling people how to live. I mean, even yeah. even though the, the, the Union of Soviets is, is Russia, but nonetheless. Um, so maybe Navalny is not going to be president quite yet, but uh, he, as you point out, he attracts the attention of the people in Russia who are politically active. And so... For them, he is an important figure. Um, what do you think of his uh, decision to come back and to get uh, basically guaranteed imprisonment for Putin's life? Uh, you know, for the, for the time that Putin is alive, that Navalny is going to be in prison. Uh, do you think that was uh, good, bad, ugly? I don't know. Are you indifferent? Uh, there's lots of opinions on this in Russia. And, uh, you know, Arkady Babchenko, of course, the famous Russian dissident who uh, uh, has taken an extreme anti-Putin stance earlier than most, almost anyone. He is not a huge fan of Navalny, and he views this as a silly type of a charade uh, designed to be uh, as showy and as TV-friendly as everything that Navalny does. And there's a lot of people in Russia who also take a very conspiratorial view of Navalny, considering him to be a, a project of one uh, secret service or another. I don't share either opinion. I think that it's a, things are much simpler uh, than a lot of these people think. I think it's, it's pretty, pretty uh, much on the surface. He is uh, undoubtedly uh, endowed with the type of personal bravery that very few people possess. He is a, a courageous individual who uh, takes risks, uh, sometimes risks that most of us would not, uh, most of us would consider to be irresponsible risk, especially considering that, you know, that he has a family. But he takes them anyway, because to him, the alternative is worse. Uh, you could see that in the interview that he done with the movie when uh, Maria Pevchik, his uh, spokesperson, stops the interview and says, like, you know, do you really want to go into all of this nationalist stuff? All of all, all you want to answer these questions because I don't want you to answer these questions. And he says, no, no, I'm not. Listen, I'll answer them because I know they're making this movie to release it after I get whacked. So he has this cavalier, very Russian attitude towards uh, a possible demise and possibly dying for the idea. This is a, a very, very endemic of uh, the stereotypical image of a Russian hero. And he, that's how he views himself and he has the right to because he definitely possesses that bravery. I think when he was in Germany recovering from his poisoning, uh, he saw two alternatives. You stay abroad, and you become kind of like the second coming of Garry Kasparov. You know, you become a comfortable critic of the regime outside. You get your speaking fees, you get the appearances of the top the TV channels, and you get to rail against Putin all you want, but you become increasingly, irre increasingly irrelevant in Russia. Now, I'm not uh, trying to disparage Kasparov right now. I mean, I probably would have done the same thing in his situation. I would have immigrated from Russia if I. I were. think I think he has much more of an impact. But I don't think Kasparov really has much of an impact in Russia. Uh, I don't think people in Russia have really. Uh, I think I think they've really tuned him out at this point, or he's just his message is largely inaccessible to them. Uh, or Navalny's second option, he knew perfectly well he was going to get arrested. He knew perfectly well he was not going to see a single day in Russia as a free man. But to him, the second option was, okay, I'm gonna become the, I'm gonna become the Russian Nelson Mandela. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do my time, but when I come out, I'm gonna come out as the next president of Russia. And uh, that's the gamble he took. And it's not a crazy gamble. <laughs> I mean, it looks like a crazy gamble to us, but to a person like Navalny, and he's without a doubt a person of very, concrete, very solid beliefs. Uh, he's set in his beliefs. 
uh, and in his rigid worldview, that was the the only decision he could have made. And uh, you know, you can you can agree or disagree. You can I don't think you can disrespect it because he has undoubtedly taken a very bitter pill that the vast majority of us would not take. So he's a hero. And what do you think are chances that he will become president of, I don't know, 5%, 10 one, zero? You know, it, it seems kind of like it's weird because it could happen tomorrow or it could never happen. Well, it kind of reminds me of that old joke. I mean, what are the chances you meet a dinosaur if you go out on the street? It's 50%. You either meet one or you don't. Uh, either Putin survives and uh, his regime survives in perpetuity for the rest of our natural lifetime. And you know, when he gets too old, he gets replaced by somebody like him, in which case Navalny never walks free again. Most likely he'll be quietly poisoned in prison. Or Putin's regime topples, in which case at this point, I don't see any alternative to Navalny. If, it's, if somebody from outside Putin's system becomes the next leader, he's the guy. He is the second coming of Yeltsin, except probably, well, definitely much less drunk because he does not drink as far as I know. And, you know, he is definitely, I mean, he's the 21st century Yeltsin. He's the Yeltsin without the vodka, but with the American education. He is definitely... Uh, the type of a populist, kind of a slightly right-wingish leader, but who might be right for Russia for today's realities and who might be less willing to put Russia through some kind of a harebrained experiment economically as Yeltsin and his advisor did, did in the 90s. And he will, of course, have their experience to, uh, to work with. But I think, yeah, I think if Putin is, uh, is dragged out of Kremlin, uh, who else? You have your ready-made Nelson Mandela right there. I mean, who else are they going to make uh, next president? Mironov? <laughs> I mean, there's nobody else. Zhirinovsky is dead. And Nem Nemtsov is dead. There's nobody else there. Uh, nobody with a name recognition. And yeah, half the population of Russia hates him uh, because he's against Putin. But by the time, if Putin is dragged out of the Kremlin, and 100% of the population of Russia is going to be hated Putin because that's that's how things are. That's how, that's how the public opinion swings here. You know, I, I kind of wonder, as was brought up by one of my uh, recent guests, the idea that if uh, Navalny came to power and Navalny was as much against corruption as he states he is, the Russians might not like him very much. <laughs> yeah, because everybody is used to kind of doing things the way they, they've been doing it. Uh, you know, you, 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 know, you kind of you get things done. You, uh, you slip somebody something under a table and you, you skip to the front of the line. But, you know, for every one person who benefits from this system, 10 people uh, suffer from it. And uh, other, other features of that system is the fact that your entire judicial uh, structure is... Uh, uh, becomes, uh, no, you know, has nothing to do with justice anymore. You don't have a fair trial in Russia ever. You don't, you don't expect any justice from, from a judge. Uh, you, you don't expect any justice from cops. Your politicians are unreliable. People you elect uh, don't answer to you. They only answer to one person. And they don't, they don't care about you, really. Uh, I think a lot of people are sick of this. And... Uh, I think if Russia is to move in any direction, other than in circles, wading through more and more blood, somebody who is unflinchingly anti-corruption is their way to go. And I would be shocked if Navalny, upon moving into the Kremlin, would become entrapped into the, in the uh, perks of power. I think he, like I said, he is a person of a very solid character. He is, uh, uh, 
he has wrapped his personality around a few very basic convictions, the main of which is politicians, officials, people endowed with public trust should not steal money. And I think he will be unflinchingly honest if he is in power. Whether he is going to be good or bad for Russia in the long run, yeah, that's anybody's guess. But at the very least, we can probably trust him with not perpetuating the system of everlasting corruption and uh, uh, you know, uh, kickbacks and oligarchy that Russia has had. You know, we had a politician like this in Ukraine with Saakashvili, and he did not survive very long. <laughs> and Ukraine, uh, Ukraine is a, a proof, uh, maybe, uh, that you can have all the desire in the world to end corruption as a political system and still fail because they're just, it's very difficult to defeat. Um, maybe, maybe you know, they, they elected Zelensky on a specific promise to end corruption, despite the fact that he's backed one of you, by one of Ukraine's major oligarchs. Um, Navalny doesn't have any type of backing like this, as far as I know. He is definitely everything. Uh, about him is anti-corruption. And uh, I would be very interested to see how, how he would succeed in that because that would be the one of the most audacious experiments in Russian history, trying to end corruption in Russia. Never been done before. This would be bigger than Gagarin. I almost, I want to take a pause after certain things. It's, you know, I, I think it's, it's worth listening to. Defeating corruption in Russia. Wow, that'll be bigger than going to space. Um, yeah, that'll be pretty severe. We, we, we'll see if uh, Navalny would be successful or beloved after instituting those kinds of uh, reforms. Um, now, how about this? There's another character, a couple of characters in the movie besides Navalny. Um, most notably, in my opinion, with all due respect, is Krista Grozev. Uh, who has uh, been a remarkable influence over uh, the Russian media field over the last uh, half a dozen years, if not more? Be well, really, since uh, Ukraine, you know, the original invasion of what fourteen, I think, and uh, and I'm just thinking that he's been, um, you know, he brought so much sense and and like almost science to this and, and logic to this madness of just trying, not madness, but just trying to uh, resist uh, the authoritarian, authoritarian uh, government. That battle, you know, it was just like being led almost on an emotional level. And then all of a sudden, Krista Grozev comes in with data and he goes, you know, okay, we have people and this is the plane tickets and this is when they left and this is when they came in and this is who was there. And we're just like, what? Uh, you know, it's, it's a whole other level of resistance that, I don't know, Russia is not familiar with this, I don't think. Yeah, and uh, Christo is a uh, uh, ultimate professional. And from Bulgaria, so from those that don't speak English and are not, and, you know, he's, he's from Bulgaria, so he speaks Russian and English with, like, slight accent. Yes, he uh, his Russian is actually pretty good, because obviously, uh, as a person of our age, he grew up during the communist era and he was uh, Russian was mandatory in Bulgarian schools but back then and of course Bulgarian and Russian are very similar languages both being Slavic um, I lived next to a village that was 100% Bulgarian but but it's like he's not a Russian he's not from Russia there's a little bit of a he's a foreigner a little bit he's definitely yeah, he's definitely a foreigner he lives in Europe I think doesn't he lives in Vienna I think uh, but uh, he is what an actual investigative genius looks like and how an actual investigative genius works. He is the real life Sherlock Holmes. Uh, he used uh, available tools in an ingenious way. I mean, he knows his way around the internet. He knows which people to pay for data. He knows which data to look for. And uh, one, uh, absolutely, I mean, the, the fact that I'm just absolutely floored by his investigative genius. This is the guy who, uh, 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 who should be getting all the credit in the world as one of the greatest uh, criminal investigative minds, or at least uh, um, information, I mean, journalistic investigative minds uh, of, of all time. 
Uh, but uh, what Grozev did, uh, which to me was very poignant, is he uncovered just how flawed and uh, how conceited uh, the, the Russian, the Russian special services are. Um, because see what, what happened in, after 2016, when the Russians interfered in the American election, a lot of people were very incredulous that that was an FSB special operation because the methods that were used, like the phishing email to the DNC, right? Those were very crude mess, methods. And a friend of mine who is an IT, was like, I cannot believe that the KGB would do that. I mean, this is just something that a teenager would do uh, to dupe an old grandpa in Wisconsin, you know, <laughs> into giving, giving their credit card accounts. And I'm like, yeah, it is. But, you know, you have to understand that KGB is not what you see in James Bond movies. They're going to try the most simplistic, stupidest uh, things possible because that these are the first things that come to mind and they require the least amount of effort. And, uh, you know, knowing how things are done in Russia, usually, um, uh, even those people who consider themselves professionals will do pretty unprofessional things and will try to uh, skate by with the least possible amount of effort. And uh, Grozov really uncovered this. I mean, this was a very uh, amateurishly done operation a lot of things, and even if it was done professionally, there's a lot of people in Russia who are willing to sell you all of that data for the right amount of money. So the way the, way the Russian society works kind of prevents uh, all of this cloak and dagger KGB Hollywood style things uh, from being pulled off successfully. And we kind of already had the inkling that they're not really and not not every fsb agent is the brightest uh, tool in the shed uh, from the botched uh, skripal assassination in england um the two guys who tried to pull them off to pull it off were definitely uh kind of caricature uh, <laughs> in the uh, bumbling spies um, and uh grows up really and then navalny of course when he called them and one of them actually answered and spilled all the beans. Uh, the famous phrase that Navalny used, Moscow for. Uh, right. And that's, that's a, actually, I think, something that uh, Grozov references originally, which is when they broke into uh, some bureaucrats' uh, email uh, or whatever it was, they, they, they was set up. That this, it was because the password was Moscow 1. Uh, the next time they came back and they tried Moscow 2 and that worked. So basically the person was saying, well, somebody broke into my Moscow 1 account. So I guess now I'm going to put the password as Moscow 2. And then they came back and the person changed it to Moscow 3 and they broke again. And so like it's, it's very simplistic, naive kind of approach to intelligence. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Get Smart, which was a TV show, which was an old TV show 30 years ago when I first discovered it. Uh, and I thought, you know, because first I was making fun of all the, the, the Russians and the the secret, uh, you know, spies and all that Russian stuff. And Mel Brooks, you know, wrote the show. Um, but it was also that they were so inept, you know, the, the chaos or chaos uh, and all that stuff. And um, there, there is a lot of ineptitude to this uh, horrible machine of death, you know, it's weird. I mean, it's just because the way the Russian system works, it works uh, with one singular goal in mind, and that's to please the leader. This is the byproduct of, a byproduct of an extremely centralized authoritarian society where only one opinion matters. And if you can present a, uh, a favorable report to the one set of ears that you care about, everything is going to be good. And if something bad happens, if you can cover your ass <laughs> well enough, which is basically when Navalny calls the secret agent, his, his would-be assassin, Navalny's character is a person in the presidential administration who is trying to produce a CYA report, a cover your ass report for Putin. And that sounds very believable to the assassin because that's the kind of thing that goes on every day there. The higher ups need to explain away a favor. <laughs> and, uh, 
uh, he spills the beans, the beans because to him that's yeah, uh, yeah that's probably how yeah I, that's what he would expect he would expect that type of phone call uh, because somebody up 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 there knows that things got botched and they need to uh, need to explain it away to to the boss um, and you know the, the system produces the type of uh, when you only have upward accountability when you're only accountable to one person up there. The people below you are not going to be as uh, dedicated to their jobs um, as the people in a system where, you know, we're in the more of a meritocratic system and where elected officials are accountable to people below them. Uh, so obviously, uh, and there's not so much loyalty to the uh, to your job as there is the loyalty to your higher ups. Uh, and uh, it's prone to it's prone to these kind of screw ups and. Uh, and it's also prone to having people advance up the ladder who are not necessarily very savvy at what they do. They're very savvy at being good politicians. They're very savvy at pleasing, just like Shoigu. Shoigu's main uh, talent is to be as in inoffensive as possible, as pleasing as possible, and as good a companion for Putin on his vacation as Putin wants. That's why he is the in command of the Russian armed forces, not because he's a brilliant general, very far from it. Um, and that's what happens at FSB level as well. I mean, that's, uh, that, that system perpetuates uh, incompetence and rewards incompetence. And Grozov did a lot in, in uncovering that. I mean, he, I don't think he really uh, had it as his goal to uncover uh, the incompetence of the Russian system, but I think he knew about it, which is why he went about investigating it the way he did. Hey, you know, if I slip some money to some folks, they're going to give me some of that, some of that info. There's the black market of info in Russia, because of course there is. People are not professionals. People want to make money off of their jobs because they're not being paid enough, and who cares? I mean, uh, we live in a country where money can, can buy you anything, so why not us? He knew that. I think that's that, that's a very good point, and uh, and hopefully, I think that's one of the reasons to watch this program in addition to watching Navalny the documentary. Because I think there's or movie, I guess I don't know. It's a documentary. It's not a mockumentary. It's pretty documented. So maybe the movie, I guess. Um, Slava, I think before we are done, I and before we, because we're going to take a short break and come back in Russian, but before we're done with this part, I want to know, what do you think? What's going on with Mr. Ovechkin? Uh, we have a, a hockey player who is on one hand uh, nearly a legend. Is he a legend on, on the ice? And on the other hand, uh, we have somebody who is... Uh, enabler and supporter of Putin uh, with a long history and a lot of devotion and all those things. And it happens to be the same person. Uh, so, and, and you've been writing a lot about him, about Avechkin. Um, what, how is, how's your battle going? You see, right now we're witnessing uh, a situation where a whole lot of Russian athletes are being blacklisted. Uh, a lot of them very deservedly, and a lot of them simply through guilt by association, uh, simply because the community, the world sporting community, does not want to stain themselves with promoting the Russian flag and with the fact that uh, these athletes, if they win something on the international stage, are bound to go back to Russia and praise Putin at some point, because that's just what's done. And because they all serve the motherland. This is the entire reason sports in Russia exist, is to promote the nation, promote the country, promote the glorious Russia. Uh, and a lot, uh, some of these athletes have uh, said pretty bad things. Some of them have participated in, the, in the pro-invasion events. Some of them have been uh, outspoken for Putin supporters. Some of them haven't really done anything other than just be Russian. Um, and they're, you know, they are deservedly and probably properly uh, excluded from the world events right now, by sporting events, for the reasons I just stated. Uh, NHL players are not. And very few athletes in Russia 
have said have been as explicitly supportive of Putin and as explicitly supportive of Putin's war in, wars in Ukraine or war, ongoing war since 2014 in Ukraine, uh, as Ovechkin has. He very explicitly uh, supported the original invasion in 2014. He called Ukrainian, Ukraine a fascist country. He, um, uh, he founded Putin team, an organization that was dedicated to helping Putin get reelected in Russia in 2018. He stood in front of cameras uh, and said, uh, for the benefit of Russian viewers in Russian, uh, that uh, nobody should ever be ashamed of supporting Putin. Everybody should loudly uh, uh, proclaim their devotion to them, to him. And um, like his exact words were, don't be afraid to appear uncool. Say it loudly, say it proudly. I am for Putin. This is 2017. Um, Russia at that point had been in Ukraine for three years. Crimea had been annexed for three years. Uh, he was, he is as unambiguously a pro-Putin Russian athlete as there is. And it, at this point, it's very, very conspicuous that so many Russian athletes, including those who have nothing to do with politics, have had to suffer guilt by association with Russia, while one of Putin's most loud and unapologetic enablers is still being promoted, adored, fawned over, written about every single day by Washington sports media. He's injured right now, probably nothing serious, but every single breath he takes is fawningly documented in the Washington Post and the likes without a single mention of the fact that he has supported and enabled war crimes and the, and the rhetoric that he has promoted for the last eight years is being used right now to wage a genocidal war in Ukraine. Not a word is being said about this. This to me is inexcusable. And the NHL will do everything in its power to make sure none of these questions are raised ever again. And when he's inducted into the Hall of Fame, nobody is ever going to question his moral character. He's, uh, they, they will want to remember him as simply the, great, the greatest whacker of pucks in the history of the game. And they don't, do not want to tarnish his legacy. That is a shame because um, what he did off the ice, in my opinion, is a lot more important to a lot more people than what he is doing on the ice. You know, Slava, I have this just this one point that I'm really curious in in light with this Mr. Ovechkin situation because I don't, you know, pay as much attention to hockey as I probably should, and uh, uh, you know, but I respect greatness and achievement in pretty much any field. But I think that Russians specifically have a kind of a disturbed. Uh, sense of professional pride and the value of professional pride and the value of being good at what you do as being more important than what it is that you do. Um, in this case, you can't say that, you know, he's a hockey player. There's nothing wrong with hockey. He's good at hockey. But there's this other component to the credibility piece, which consists of competence and character. He's got plenty of competence, but his character is in question. And, and uh, it, does it matter? You know, I think to Russian speakers, character is, is not, uh, you know, as important as professional competence. I find that interesting. Probably. Um, probably. Uh, I think Russians are more liable to say, uh, let's separate this from that, which is ironic because in Russia, sports has never been separate from politics. That's nonsense. But OK, a lot of Russians will say, for example, who cares about Dostoevsky's anti-Semitism? He was a great writer. Or who cares about Tolstoy's being abusive, emotionally abusive to his wife? He was a great writer. Yes, but Americans are not like that. And we know this. Uh, how many Americans will say, well, let's just talk about Roman Polanski as a director and nothing else? How many Americans are going to say, you know, Woody Allen is a great actor and there's nothing else about him that's important? Or Kevin Spacey, there's nothing that he's done that, is, that, sh that should be talked about other than his acting. 
Americans are going to say that because Americans really, really care about uh, the moral character of their celebrities, for better or for worse. Uh, not so with Ovechkin, <laughs> really, really. Sport hockey fans, they have this small sport complex. You know, hockey is a small sport. I'm sorry, Canada. It is. I'm also sorry, Michigan. It is a small sport. Nobody. Our, our apologies to all our viewers in Canada. You're great. Uh... It's a small sport. People in Amer in North America have this, who are hockey fans, are desperately trying to prove to everyone else that their sport is important, just as important as basketball, especially for some reason. Uh, uh, and they will cling to their heroes with a death grip. And they will, Ovechkin is a hockey hero, and my, my good, and he is uh, one of the most recognizable faces in their sport, and they do not want that face to disappear off the front pages and be dominated by, uh, by the Greek freak in your great state of Wisconsin, or by Tom Brady, or by the greatest of them all, Josh Allen, the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills. But they obviously want to what uh, what 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 what, what? <laughs> who is it <laughs> no they or or by or okay or by cristiano ronaldo they want hockey to be on the front pages and the vegan of course is hockey's most exciting superstar so they will excuse anything he does and anything he says and i will be and i'll keep saying this month really you don't think you don't think that there's anything that's going to change there i mean even washington uh you know football team changed their name they did it took a long time my goodness, I remember when I came to America in 1991 and I was in high school and I was in a debate club in high school without being able to speak English. I, <laughs> but, uh, I bet you were good. I bet I you were very, good. I had very persuasive facial expressions. But that topic was being discussed in 1991 about the Redskins changing their name. It, 30 years later, they finally done it. One murder too many. But... Uh, uh, I think, uh, I don't know how many atrocities it will take. Uh, and I don't know how many explicit statements from Ovechkin, which I think he is too smart to make. But if he does, if he continues to support Putin when he comes back to Russia, things might change. I think if he goes back to Russia and is photographed with Putin or takes part in those Z events, or is simply you know, living it up in Turkey somewhere, takes Instagram pictures on a yacht, as there's more See, this is something that you mentioned though i think in, uh, in one of your uh, tweets that uh, all these athletes they're going to go to russia during the off season and they will be painted with mud uh, all yeah. over them and they won't be able to escape that yeah i mean some of them are uh, definitely i mean uh, i think there's a lot of agents right now working overtime trying to tell their uh, the russian superstars in the nhl what to avoid when they're back home, but some of them won't be able to avoid it, and some of them will probably proudly go uh, go out there and uh, support the special operation. And then those NHL teams will have a lot of things to answer, especially if more and more mass graves are uh, dug up around Mariupol and uh, and Kharkiv and, and uh, Melitopol and Kherson. You know, it's uh, it's just a it's it's an inescapable. And uh, a lot of people, I mean, maybe it's unfair to make people answer questions just because of where they were born. But hey, that's the world we live in. Uh, can we now look at Germans who lived in the 1940s Germany without ever thinking which side they were on? We can't. I mean, if you were a German who was alive in the 40s and, and an adult in the 40s, uh, you you were not able to live the rest of your life without answering those questions. It's just, just the reality of life. And uh, when, when the world is in such a crisis and, and such horrible crimes are being committed in the name of your country, uh, you're going to have to answer those questions. And a lot of Russian hockey players will not answer them satisfactorily, unfortunately. And even those who can, like, like Artemi Panarin of the Rangers, are silent right now. It's a crying shame. Well, we'll keep watching this. Um, Slava, thank you so much for joining me on this program. It was really interesting to, obviously, I'm glad that you, you know, you shared your point of view of uh, Navalny, but I think that uh, the Avishkin saga as well, and just it's a, it's a big conversation, and uh, thank you for, for staying on that. 
um in spite of you know i'm i'm pretty sure you're passionate about hockey i mean i think you're kind of all sport i mean you care about it's not like you're an anti-hockey guy I love you're a, you know especially obscure ones like lacrosse quidditch and hockey uh, obscure sports that only like two or three people in the world care about i quidditch, love hockey no wait okay. I, was the, I was at the high school lacrosse game today my the school i teach at played the game today i left at halftime they were up 13 nothing and nothing interesting was going to happen but you know i softball i go to everything so hockey fans don't take it personally but you are a small sport it's not like you're the 100 meter dash at the olympics let's face it nobody cares and you should subscribe to Slava on Twitter and to this channel on YouTube. And my name is Yuri Rashkin. It's great to have you with us. Uh, take care.